Biblical blood pressure. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about how I got my blood pressure down in a biblical way. Without drugs, you're having coffee with Conrad on. Conrad Rocks! Welcome, welcome, welcome to yet another edition of Coffee with Conrad. This is Conrad from ConradRocks.net. That's my blog, where you can find podcasts, YouTube videos, and blog posts. And my passion is for you to have a spiritual relationship with the biblical Jesus. When I talk about having a relationship with Jesus, the biblical Jesus, there's stuff that's laid out in Scripture for us. And one of them has how we're supposed to eat biblically. And this is how I biblically lowered my blood pressure. Today, I'm taking some audio extracted from a Facebook Live. And without further ado, here is the podcast on biblical blood pressure. We are having coffee with Conrad at ConradRocks.net. And over the years, when I would go to the doctor, they'd say, hey, do you have high blood pressure? And when I'd get my glasses or contact lenses, they'd keep asking me that. And it's one of those things that I was saying to myself, I'm going to look into it later. I'm young, and it's not important right now. And then about a month ago, I went to the doctor. I had a sore throat, and the doctor says I have bad allergies. But I had really high blood pressure. And I'm like, you know, I keep hearing this, that I have high blood pressure, so I got to do something about it. And there were some people in my family that had high blood pressure, and, you know, they took the pills, and I saw what the pills was doing to them. You know, it just totally, I mean, I'd rather have the high blood pressure than see what the effects of the blood pressure pills do. And I I took a step back. I took a panoramic view of their life. And I started to notice the way they ate. (laughs) You know, I was like going, you know, that is not healthy. And uh, they smoked for a while. My grandparents smoked for a while, but they gave it up once they got the bad news. You know, you got to stop smoking. My grandfather developed emphysema and had heart problems. And he had more compelling reasons to change than to stay the same. We'll probably talk about that for a little bit. But like I said, I went in to, uh, I had this sore throat, and I went in to go get my uh, my test to see if I had that COVID that's going around. Or It felt like strep throat, but the doctor said it was allergies. And it hung on for a long time. Um, and I've usually been healthy in the last few years. I, wouldn't, I, I didn't have bad allergies for a long time. When they when they said this for like the twelfth time over the last decade or however long, it reminded me of a time where I had extremely high triglycerides, or that is basically the very low density lipids, the VLDLs. And this doctor says, "Hey, you know, I say this with aloha because I was I was living in in Oahu at the time in Hawaii." And he says, hey, man, you're going to die if you don't change this. And that got my attention. And I thought, I I was telling the doctor, I said, you know what? I don't do any sugar at all. (laughs) That's what I was telling him. And this is going to lead to this part of the podcast where I talk about evidence procedures. We're going to be talking about that. And as he told me, I needed to lower my, my sugar intake. I immediately went out and I bought this book called Sugar Busters. Uh, I'll apply, I'll provide the affiliate link to where you can get that book. And as I read it, I started noticing that there's sugar in everything. I mean, there's there's corn syrup. What is it? The, the corn syrup. There's all this stuff that's used as a preservative in everything. I mean, there's sugar in everything. And then I started noticing throughout my day, I started doing evidence procedures, which we're going to be talking about. 
I would have like a Slurpee at 7-Eleven. I would have a Three Musketeers. I had uh, papaya, guava, and mangoes. I had those trees growing in my backyard, and I made this big fruit smoothie every morning. I thought I was being healthy, but I was taking in way too much, way too much sugar. And then I, I started looking at the labels on the, on the cans of, uh, you know, in the store on the shelf. And I'm like, oh, man, there's sugar in absolutely everything. So I started cutting out my sugar, and I lost like 30 pounds in a month. I mean, I just drastically cut it. I mean, I had a drastic, compelling reason to change. And uh, let's talk about that. When I, when I started hearing about my blood pressure, I, I developed some compelling reasons to change than to stay the same. You know, it's really interesting how we are our own worst enemy when it comes to living right. You know, it's like our flesh wants things that kills us. And we have, it's like fire. You know, I was doing, I was doing my walk this morning. And sometimes on Instagram, if you guys follow me over there, I'll talk about some of the revelations I get in prayer. And I was talking about how our phones, our phones can kind of be like fire, you know? Our phones can burn down our house, kill our family, (laughs) you know, it can burn down everything. It's like fire, or it can be a powerful tool for ministry. Think of internal combustion. That is fire. Think of fire for cooking food. So we have to get a grip, and we have to be in control. You know, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. We have to keep our body under subjection, like Paul says. So I looked for these compelling reasons to change, and basically, I just want to be healthy. I don't want, I don't want to feel bad just being alive. I don't want to have joints in, that ache and that hurt. It's not something that I want. And I also have more to do for Jesus. I do not want to die with the music still inside, right? Jesus gives us a great co-mission. He's a co-laborer with us. He inspires us to do things, and he's there with us. And I want to get it out of me. I can't die with music inside. I cannot die without fulfilling You know, like Paul says, I've run the good race. I have fought the good fight of faith. We've got to get it out. And he says at one point, I have not hidden the full counsel of God from you. I got it out. I said it all. Amen. So I started realizing that if I want to please Jesus, and Jesus is, you know, he's my Lord and my Savior. Then I want to I want to do what he said. He's, he's the author and finisher of my faith. If he's the author, which is the root word for authority, you know, I'm going to do what he says. And I started noticing that there are three main covenants in the Bible where God defines food. I'm not really sure if you've looked into this, but God defines food in the Bible. Three times it come to my mind that I'm going to talk about. Um, I know in the New Testament, the NIV NIV says Jesus declared all foods clean. But I'm not talking about that one. I'm talking about where he originally defines what food is. And if you look at how God defines food in the Bible, there is a stark contrast between what we see in the contents of our Campbell's chicken noodle soup. Or, or look, dude, look at your Coca-Cola can or your Diet Coca-Cola can and hold it up next to the Torah and say, hey, you know... This ain't in the Bible, right? So in Genesis 21, 6, God is taught, uh, excuse me, in Genesis 2, 16, that's Genesis 2, 16, God is talking to Adam. And this is before he sinned, so there was no meat yet. Uh, there was no, well, it's interesting how the Bible calls fruit meat. Okay, I don't know if, you, if you've caught that in the King James, it'll often do that. To you it shall be for meat. But he had not sinned, so there was no sacrificing sheep or goats. And God says something very interesting here in Genesis 2.16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. And then he says you can't eat of the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
So there we have the beginning of God saying what's food and what's not food. He didn't say, Adam, you can go eat that shrimp. (laughs) We're going to talk about Noah here in a moment. Or you can go eat that rock over there. He says, of every tree of the garden, thou mayest freely eat. So then, here comes along Noah. And keep in mind, in the book of Genesis, this is post-flood when God, God is given a new covenant about food. Right? It's contrasted with the covenant about food that he gives Adam. And it's contrasted with the covenant about food that he gives Moses in Leviticus chapter 11. So, here we see that the floods already happened. They have this new dispensation, this new thing going on. There's this new covenant. And he says to Noah in Genesis chapter 9, verse 3, Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. Now, he doesn't say monosodium glutinate. He doesn't say all this stuff, this preservative processed stuff that we have in our foods today, which is causing us to be sick. Now, as time goes on, he establishes a more restrictive, more restrictive dietary uh, covenant with Moses. And he's speaking to the children of Israel. You'll notice uh, that he says, you know, if something dies of it itself, you can't eat it. But the, the Gentiles can. I think he says that somewhere. But if you look at Leviticus chapter 11, I'm not going to read the whole thing. He starts getting in. You can't eat the osprey. You can't eat the coney. You can't, you know, and he talks about the parting of the holes and the chewing the could. He gets into that. And I think that's kind of where the pork comes from, where people don't eat pork. If you appeal to that NIV scripture, uh, I'm not going to be dogmatic about this, but it's an interesting thing that Jesus says in Mark 7.19, and this is the NIV. Okay, which comes from the West Cotton Hort translation. It's not from the Texas Receptus or the, what's what we call the majority text. But he's talking about, for it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach and then out of the body. Now, in, in parentheses, in the NIV, it says, in saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. Right? In the King James, it says, because it entereth not into his heart, but into the belly, and goeth out into the drought purging all meats. Interesting contrast there, isn't it? But let's say that the NIV is right. Uh, Jesus was basically saying, hey, you can go back to the covenant with Noah. I'm I'm not dogmatic about it, but, you know, I kind of think we can eat some bacon. (laughs) But, But let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. I just thought that would be interesting. Now. So as I started noticing the contrast, you know, I have this high blood pressure. I've got to do something about it. Well, I see the junk that we put in our body today. I believe that we suffer from disease because we're eating things that God did not prescribe. He did not lay it out as food in the Bible. And I noticed that. If you go on YouTube and you start looking at people that are having amazing, healthy lives, they won't say it, come right out and say it, but they're eating biblical diets. I've seen this one lady, and I think she's in her 80s or 90s. She looks extremely healthy. She looks like 50, and she's a vegan. Well, there is the covenant with Adam. Right, right. Jack LaLanne was juicing. How about that movie, Fat, Sick, and Nearly Dead, which has been transforming the lives of many people on the world? That is a high plant-based whole food diet, right? And keep in mind, I'm not a doctor, nor do I play one on TV. You may have varying results, but I'm, I'm talking about biblical blood pressure, and I believe that if we get back to the food that God defines as food, that we're going to live healthier. So as I understood this biblical precedent of food, I also decided to read some articles 
to verify and confirm what the Bible's already saying. I was motivated. So I read many, many top articles from, you know, like WebMD. I read, you know, the, the top sources where, where doctors talk about health. And one of the problems that I didn't do is I didn't look towards fake experts. And I don't claim to be an expert, but we need to appeal to people that have, it's not necessarily, um, you don't have to have a PhD to be an expert. But what I'm saying is there's a lot of people that sell snake oil today. And we need to have people that have been challenged. For instance, um, if someone comes out and makes an extraordinary claim, like uh, if you eat oysters, your blood pressure will go down. Well, we're going to need a double-blinded study. We're going to need, you know, it just this, if we succumb to this fake expert saying, if you just eat oysters, your blood pressure will go down, they need to be challenged in that. So I, I made it a point to go through people who have been tried and seasoned to know what they're talking about, right? We need to have track records, double-blinded studies, that type of thing of things that work, or we're going to end up buying snake oil, right? And that guy, he goes from town to town and disappears, and then you're out your money. And I also didn't want to take medicine, okay? But Because I don't believe medicine is necessarily... God's prescription, let's put it this way, God's prescription is to eat the right food in the first place. Well, we messed up. We found ourselves in this situation. And I look back at my family members and I look back at friends that have taken blood pressure medicine and they tell, and you can tell by their countenance, they're not doing good. There should be a better approach. And as I look back at my panoramic view from my family members' life and so forth, I saw that they had a bad diet. They ate the fried foods. They, you know, my dad, my uncle, and they didn't do too well, right? And then, like I said, I watched the longevity of people with the high, high plant-based whole food diets, the people with the most centurions on the planet in Japan, look at the way they eat. So I started doing that. And what these people said, in order to lower blood pressure, one of the things you need to do is cut out caffeine. Caffeine was a huge problem with me. My podcast is called Coffee with Conrad. And it started from when I when I would get to the office at six o'clock in the morning. I'd have to get up at four. And I found that I was drinking a pot of coffee <laughs> by by noon, all by myself. So I had to cut out caffeine. So I drastically cut out caffeine. So I looked for biblical substitution. I kind of think that maybe green tea is a good substitution, right? And I found that I could actually, you know, I could function. I used to think I couldn't function without a whole bunch of caffeine. But now you find that, now I find is that if I continue on, too much caffeine leads to more, worse insomnia. You know, I already have insomnia. Too much caffeine makes it much worse. The next big thing that uh, I noticed that the people were talking about was salt. You know, Jesus talks about salt. You're the salt of the earth. The salt is, you know, you don't want the salt to lose its savor. And I started noticing, just like I talked about earlier in the Sugar Busters diet, there is salt in absolutely everything. If it's in a can, if it's like cheese has salt. I didn't really know about this. Susan said I'm probably stupid because everybody knows that there's a lot of salt in cheese. I did not know that. There's salt in bread. Dude, a sandwich. You can have a sandwich with processed turkey, right? Turkey's biblical, but processed turkey isn't, right? There's so much salt and things that cure it that are bad for you. And then you add the cheese to that. Then you add the mayonnaise. And then you add the two slices of bread. Well, dude, you're about to pass your USRDA uh, recommended allowance of sodium with a sandwich, right? So I started noticing that I had to cut out these things. And what I realized is when I started cutting out these things, that I'm going back to a biblical diet, kind of like the covenant with Noah. And uh, I'm like, you know, because he didn't have all this sodium in these foods. And I know in the Bible days, they did preserve their food with salt. But that's a caveat for another argument at some time. Now, the next thing that I noticed uh, in order to lower blood pressure blood pressure from the experts, was exercise. Now, for the salt, you just need, well, I'm going to get into that in a second. Exercise. 
So I like to do, I, I wear a Fitbit type uh, of, of a watch. It's basically a watch that, that does my heart rate. It take, keeps track of my steps. And I like to swim too. So I just started upping my exercise a little bit. That's all I did. And I've been, I've been struggling with allergies, so I hadn't been able to do it too much. Also, there's breathing exercises. You ever notice that um, when you have a panic attack, if you ever had a panic attack, One of the things that happen is you're not breathing from your diaphragm and you're breathing from high up in your chest and you're breathing really fast. Well, this is going to affect your blood pressure. In some of my research, I found that if you just slow down your breathing, you know, um, and breathe really slow and deep, there's many different exercises you can find on the internet. One is where you just breathe five seconds in really deep to your belly and then blow out five seconds slowly and just continue to do that. Your heart rate will lower and also where your, will your blood pressure will too. This leads me to evidence procedures. I know I talked a little bit about evidence procedures. Remember earlier in this podcast, I was talking about how I didn't realize how much sugar I was taking into my body. Well, I didn't realize how much salt I'm taking into my body. So with measuring the steps, I'll include a um, an affiliate link for a Fitbit. It keeps track of your heart rate. Some of them actually keep track of your blood pressure, but they I don't think they're very good to be honest. If you if you see a watch on Amazon that says it keeps track of your blood pressure, I would probably uh, be highly suspicious of that. But um, with Fitbits, you can keep track of your steps. You can sync them up to Google Fit, right? And uh, so I'll include a link there. And I keep track of my steps that I do every day. Also, I keep track of my salt. You have to have an evidence procedure. In other words, if you're going to lose weight, you need to get on the scales and see how much you weigh each day or each week. If it's not working, you need to adapt and change. You need to have evidence procedures. Then I started measuring my caffeine. I simply just cut out most of my caffeine. Uh, Like I said, I'm doing green tea, and one green tea is equivalent to one-eighth of a cup of coffee of caffeine. So that's, I'm drastically reduced my caffeine. Also, I started measuring my blood pressure with a blood pressure monitor. I'll include a link in the show notes for uh, where you can measure blood pressure. Because I wanted to see if doing this, if throwing out these processed foods was actually doing something. And I did watch my blood pressure consistently drop down to, uh, finally, I got it to 123 over 70, 78 or 77. I put a, I put a picture up on Facebook. It's pretty cool. So um, that's it. That's what I did. I'm not sure if this is going to work for you, but this is what I did. And I'm going to continue to keep the caffeine out. I'm going to try to keep the salt out. I'm going to try to keep my steps going and I'm going to keep measuring my blood pressure from time to time just to make sure that I don't fall back into that trap. So I challenge you to just take a look, you know, measure your blood pressure. If it's high, take a step back and say, look, where am I missing? Where, where am I going wrong here? And then compare your diet to scripture. It'll blow your mind. Start looking at the salt content and the sugar content if you want to of the processed foods. It will blow your mind. Anyway, um, that's it. That's how I lowered my blood pressure down. And probably, you know, to be honest, it it was a month, but it, it was dropping for a whole month as, as I started to change. And as I started to change, I didn't just immediately go to fresh fruits and vegetables. Like, for instance, for lunch, dude, I really want a hamburger and fries. <laughs> That's what I really want, right? But what I do to kind of trick myself, I'll make this huge salad. I mean, I'll cut up carrots, bell peppers, cucumbers, cauliflower. I, I like to call it a rainbow salad. And then I took a very low sodium hamburger patty. They sell those hamburger patties in uh, Walmart, you know, uh, and they don't have much sodium in it. And then I watch how much sodium is inside my. Um, dressing and I watch how much sodium is inside. Like sometimes I'll put uh, salsa on there and I'll just keep track. And I have a huge salad that's filling and it's low sodium. So that's one of my tricks there.
God bless you. If this has touched you, please share this with your friends and family on social media. And remember the word fist. Let's take a fist to the devil. Let's beat him on the head. F is for Facebook. Please follow me on Facebook. That's where I get a lot of my interaction from my listeners. I is for Instagram. Do something a little bit inter- little different on Instagram. Sometimes I share my sidewalk chalk or some of my revelations that I do during my prayer walk. So be sure to follow me on Instagram. I'll provide the link to that. S is for subscribe. Please subscribe to wherever you're listening to this podcast. A lot of people like to subscribe on the YouTube channel because you can get closed caption. That's for the hard of hearing. You can also get a transcript if you have a computer. And uh, it's easy to comment over there. So I'll include the link to that. And T is for Twitter, F-I-S-T. I am Most Radical Man on Twitter. Talk to me over there. God bless you. Till we meet again, dig deeper and go higher. Dig deeper, go higher at comradrocks.net.